Hello, everybody. I'm going to uh, be presenting in the back of the room for some technical difficulties with the clicker. So, uh, um, all the content should be up there, so you don't really have to look at me anyways. <laughs> um, but yeah, welcome to my presentation, Launch Chart for Drupal, a uh, solid combo for AD testing. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank all the sponsors. Um, they're gracious enough to make it so that this uh, uh, convention can be uh, free for all attendees. Uh, so yeah, once again, thank you to all the sponsors. Um, a little bit about me. I'm a backend engineer at Civic Actions. Um, I've been working at Civic Actions for about two and a half weeks now, um, and this is my second time speaking at CubCon. Um, before I worked at Civic Actions, I was a developer with the university. I worked in higher ed for a few years before that. So I've been working in Drupal for about eight years now. Um, in my free time, I like to hike in Canada. Um, and uh, I volunteer with my high, local high school robotics club, so I, I coach high school robotics, and I am on my city's planning um, And here are a couple links if you want to get in touch with me, my D.O. profile on LinkedIn. Uh, next, a little bit about Civic Actions. We're a fully remote digital services company that helps the government deliver better public services through open technology and design. We work with government clients using our expertise in digital accessibility, free and open source software, and human-centered design. Uh, these are some uh, icons of the clients, some of the biggest clients that we work with, uh, like Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, Department of Veterans Affairs, National Science Foundation, and links. This year is our 20th anniversary of being a company. You can find us on the web at civicactions.com, and you can come visit us in booth number 25, where you could enter to win a uh, set of headphones, uh, noise canceling Bluetooth headphones. So a little bit about this talk. Um, this is the overview of what we'll be going through. Um, first, we'll talk about the basics of AB testing. Um, specifically, um, the talk is about launch directly testing. So we'll get into launch directly and feature flags and how that is the, like, the basis of the launch directly experiments, which is launch, start, launch directly framework for AB testing. Um, finally, we'll tie it all together with Drupal and get into a little bit of code um, on how we can do that. So uh, first, bas basics of A-B testing, or uh, you might be familiar with a, a, another name for it, the ABN testing or split testing. Um, ABN testing because there can be more than two um, variations in your test, and split testing because basically what you're doing is splitting users into different groups different variations of things with that. An AB test is basically just a way to compare two or more things and see which one works. Um, you have to be able to measure that in some way. This is done by having some predefined metrics set up based upon what your goal is. Uh, so for this example, we have two different colored call to action buttons. Um, one's orange, one's green. Our goal is to have a web page that drives users to perform that call to action. So the way we can measure that is by keeping track of how many clicks we get on the call to action button. And then we would split users into randomly into two equal groups and see which call to action is put on more frequently. Uh, so what are the components of an AB test? Um, not everyone does A-B testing exactly the same way. Uh, people develop different playbooks uh, for their A-B tests based on their own needs. But here are some basic components that should uh, hopefully be in most A-B tests. Uh, the first component that was on that slide was evaluate. Um, so for example, let's say we have a website and we want to be relatively sure that our website is providing the best experience possible. Uh, first, we need to evaluate our website. Uh, this means we need to review any existing data that we have, and then we need to gather even more data and review that as well. Uh, finally, we take a look at all that data and find opportunities for improvement. Using the sample from before, 
Uh, what we could have done there is taken a look at the page with the orange call to action button. So if we look back, that was an orange call to action button. Um, and gathered any data that we could about it. Things like how many users are clicking the button, how many users are bouncing off the page, uh, how long are users staying on the page. Uh, really, um, whatever data you can find on that, on that call to action button. Um, and then figure out whatever metrics you can measure. Uh, and if you haven't been measuring um, anything with that call action button, then you need to start and get data from this. Um, so in our situation, we would have looked at all that data and realized that users are not performing our call action. Um, so once we realize that we're not getting the, the results we want, uh, we have to think of how we can fix that. We have to make a, a hypothesis or an assumption um, supported by the data, um, and we decide that our button just doesn't stand out. Uh, so we make a hypothesis that if we change our call to action from orange to maybe green, more users will, will perform a call to action. After we form our hypothesis, then we need to strategize how uh, we can make sure our change is effective. Um, so our strategy is basically a way that we make sure our change is worse than the previous change, or the previous, the existing uh, way that it is. Our strategy would be to create an A-B test that has a control group uh, where users would experience the same orange button, and an experiment group, or a test group, where the variation would be green for users. Um, and then we have to decide how we can tell which one is performing better. Uh, to do this, we would determine how long we should run our experiment and how many users are basically clicking on that call to action and which one is most successful. Finally, uh, we get to the experiment. We set it up, we run everything for some degree, predetermined amount of time that we came up with while we were strategizing. And once our test is complete, we analyze the results. Was our experiment inconclusive, meaning that the green button was pressed less than the orange button, the orange button being our control? Or was our test successful, meaning that the green button was in fact pressed more uh, than the control? And those are the basics of an A-B test. Um, now we're going to move on to launch directly. Uh, launch directly is what uh, we use on the project that I worked on to um, uh, do our A-B testing. Uh, launch chart did provide some framework for that call experience. Uh, I'm going to give a quick overview of what Launch chart really is and then talk a little bit about feature flags. Um, feature flags are kind of a pre prerequisite for experiments in Launch chart. Um, so Launch chart really describes itself on its website as uh, enabling developers to securely manage software features with feature flags on a massive scale. Um, but basically what it is is a software as a service platform uh, that allows teams to use feature flags to release, monitor, and optimize software. Oftentimes you'll see these flags used right in the production environment. Uh, so that brings us to feature flags. Since Launch Rightly is at its core feature flag software, the feature flags are one of the building blocks for A-B tests, which first talk about feature flags. So, a feature flag, also known as feature toggles or flippers, or there are some other names that people use as well, there are options in your environment that allow you to turn on features or some functionality um, on or off without the need to deploy new code. Um, generally, with Launch Darkly, these toggles can happen at runtime, meaning that you can see the changes as you're toggling flags on and off. Uh, with some of the other options that I'm going to show in a minute, um, you may need to refresh a page before you can see the change, or you may even get clear cache in order to see the change. So, uh, some of the pros and cons of feature flags. Um, pros, runtime changes, meaning you can see the changes as they happen. Um, it, it allows for the decoupling of deployments and release. It can be used for beta testing, it can be used to target and personalize websites. Uh, it can be used as a kill switch. Uh, if you're developing a feature and you 
I'm not sure if it's going to work right. Hopefully, you don't make it to that point. But um, yeah, you can turn it on immediately, and it will go back to its previous configuration. And finally, it allows for A-B testing, which is what we're here for. Some of the disadvantages are that it does uh, come with some extra maintenance and overhead. There is in increased complexity, um, and there are potential security risks using feature plugins. Uh, you can mitigate a lot of those disadvantages by just planning a lot more upfront and developing playlists before you actually implement any of the feature plugs. So here are some options for feature plugs. Um, I mean, really, you can use custom configuration in like a Drupal admin form you know, to toggle some boxes and turn features on and off. Um, there are feature modules, feature toggle, and feature plugs. I haven't used either of them, so I'm not sure uh, how well they work. Um, and then there are other third party apps similar to Launcher that really like, optimize the flex and the toggle. Um, uh, some of the reasons that we use Launch Directly over any of these options are because, well, first of all, Launch Directly offers a federal instance, so it's uh, its own instance for federal contracts. Um, it has A-B testing built in. It has a very large number of supported languages and integrations. Um, it allows for updates in real time, which uh, I don't think any of these other um, applications modules allow for. And it has the most uh, security uh, certifications out of any of these. So we're here to talk about Launch Directly. These next few slides are going to be um, how to set up like, a project within Launch Directly. Um, the first thing you set up in Launch Directly are projects. Uh, you can have multiple projects within Launch Directly, and it's ultimately up to you to decide how to use them. Launch Directly says that pro projects allow you to manage multiple different business objectives from a single account. So, for instance, a project can be dedicated to a website. A mobile app, or something else. You can split it up even further and have different projects for different pieces of your website or different web applications within your website. Uh, the most common pattern here is to dedicate a project for um, each separate product that you have. Um, so you would have one project uh, for a product, even if there are front end and back end pieces of that project. Um, that way, that project will sit, share the same feature flags, and you can turn on the entire feature that we're using from the back end go all at once. Um, within projects, there's also something called environments. Um, in the example here, there are two projects, default and play school, and each project has two environments. So environments allow you to further define organizational units within your project. Each project must have at least one uh, the common scheme here is to have an environment in Launch Directly for each environment that corresponds to a part of your development lifecycle. So if you have you know, a development environment, a test environment, a production environment, you would want each of those as their own environments within Launch Directly as well. Um, by default, each project starts with a test and production environment. This example shows what happens when you click on the project environment drop down in the top left corner of one chart. Uh, it shows the box where you can see the current project is default and current environment is production. Um, each environment also has its own keys and IDs that allow you to interact with that specific environment uh, through the so, uh, the keys and IDs. Here's an example that shows each environment in the project and how each environment has its own SDK key, mobile key, client side ID. Uh, these keys and IDs are used when you're connecting these environments to your code through an SDK or a software development kit. Um, an SDK is a set of tools for a specific platform that includes frameworks and libraries that you can build with. Launch Directly has dozens of SDKs, um, but we'll get a little bit more. So, uh, create feature flags. Um, we've got our environment set up. It's time to actually create a feature flag. Uh, these flags are created for all environments on the project, but each environment will have its own target, meaning that 
Um, every environment will get a feature play, but each environment you can toggle it on or off independently. The things you need to know about feature play before creating one are listed on the left there. Um, the first couple are play identifiers of name and key. For these, you want to develop um, a convention that you can use over and over. Um, chances are at some point you'll have a lot of flags going on and it'll be helpful for you to be able to see the flag name and quickly know what that flag does. Um, just by reading the name. Uh, the name is what appears on the list of flags in Launch Directly. The key is how the flag is represented in the code. Um, the description, this is, uh, it, it should be no longer than a sentence or two. And it shouldn't repeat the same thing that the name or the key is conveying. Um, some things you might want to put in the description are things like who is responsible for the flag, what toggling it might do, or any side effects that might be caused by toggling it. Um, and finally, the variations of the flag are set. Uh, for most flags, this will be a Boolean value with true or false, but you can also set other multivariate values with strings or integers. Uh, a lot of flags are used for turning features on or off, um, and in that case, you don't really need targeting. But maybe uh, you have a feature and you want to release it gradually to a population, um, maybe a certain percentage over time, then you can need to target people within that population to release it to. Um, or maybe you have something like an AB test where you want to target two um, groups of people. Uh, with different flags or different variations of flag. Uh, this is where targeting comes, along, comes in. Targeting allows us to create rules in order to target certain populations of users of flags. Uh, this example shows a targeting rule that evaluates the flag as true if the user has an email and an email. Uh, otherwise, it evaluates the flag as false. So, in order for your feature to be evaluated, you need some sort of context. Um, about who or what is encountering that flag. Uh, Contexts in Launch Directly are defined as people, services, machines, or other resources that encounter feature flags in the product. So uh, users are a type or kind of context. There can be other kinds as well, such as devices, locations, or organizations. Um, when, you're, when you're creating your targeting rules, you'll have to define which context you're targeting. Um, then when you're evaluating your flags within the code, you provide uh, context with that evaluation call to the SDK. In this, in this example, we're creating a user kind of context that has an email attribute. Uh, we'll initialize our launch product client and use that context when we initialize. Um, and we'll, I'll show this code again later on when we're talking a little bit more about integrating. The last item we need to know about is feature flags are metrics. Metrics are used to evaluate feature flags or uh, basically tell you how well a feature flag is performing. Um, you can use them to tell you things such as how, we, how often a URL is visited or how long a page takes to load. Basically, they measure, let you measure how effective your flags are. Launch Directly supports four different types. Um, click conversion metrics, which are how many times somebody, something is clicked. Um, custom conversion, Metrics, how many times an arbitrary event happens, such as some service being called. Uh, custom numeric metrics, they track numeric values against the baseline. Uh, for example, this could be used in like shopping cart if you want to know how many items are in carts and so much checking out. Um, and finally, page view conversion metrics is how many times a page is viewed. So now we know all about feature legs. <laughs> We can start looking at experiments. Experiments in launch directly frameworks that we've tested. Everything we've learned about up to this point with feature flags and all their components are also used in experiments. Uh, feature flags are kind of like one of the building blocks for experiments within launch directly. Um, so, the first thing we have to do with experiments is actually design them. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about the basic components of AB tests. Now we can kind of see how those components roll these to launch directly. Um, 
There are four major components that you have to consider when designing a sphere, an experiment with n launch data. Um, first is the details. This is where you evaluate your data and develop your hypothesis. This covers those first two components that I mentioned earlier. Uh, metrics, variations, and audience all kind of fall into that third component from earlier, which is strategize. Um, metrics determine what kind of metrics you'll need to measure. Uh, variations are how many and what should they be. Sorry, the metrics go. Or variations go. And the audience is um, should you know all the visitors to your site um, be targeted or should be some subset of users. Uh, the fourth component, experiments, that we talked about earlier, actually comes after all of this, after designing the experiment. So we designed our experiment, hopefully documented it somewhere. Um, now we can set it up and launch it. Um, when we're in the, in the project and uh, environment where our experiment would run, we can create, unlike feature types, um, experiments can only be created in a single environment at a time. So if you want to run an experiment in a test environment, and then again in a production environment, you'll need to create two separate experiments. So once we're ready, we open the experiment page, with the menu item on the left hand menu, this brings up a page that lists all the present past experiments and allows you to create new ones. Uh, then we click on the create experiment button on the right there. This brings us to a long form with different sections. Um, each section needs to be filled out before the next section becomes available. Um, and due to the space, I'll cut all these slides, I can put an image in the entire form. So we'll just take one section at a time, just like they do on the actual one. Um, the first section is the experiment details. Uh, this is where you enter the name of the experiment and your hypothesis that you came up with when designing the experiment. Um, we also need to select, select an experiment type, uh, which is kind of self-explanatory based off the, the description of the buttons there. Um, the first one, basically just compare two different things, see which one wins. The second one is more in-depth, and it's uh, like you can compare two different user flows. So for instance, if you have a, what's going to be a checkout, for example, cart checkout, and you have flow that includes three button clicks, and you have a flow that includes one button click. That's where you use the follow up optimization to, to compare things, since it's not a one to one kind of um, text. Next, we'll need to set the randomization units and any, any attributes for that. Um, so for experience, you want traffic to be randomly distributed between your variations. Um, this is where you can say which context should be used to sort that track. Uh, so in this instance, we're saying you know all of our users split them up randomly into two groups, so that you know, some go into one variation, some go into another. Next, we'll add the metric. This is you know, what's used to measure the performance of each variation. On this example, I have the CTA click. Measure that I added there, and it's just tracking how many clicks that call the action button is. Uh, next, we set variations. Um, this is just that, that basic Boolean variation. Uh, some people will be targeted with the true variation, some will be targeted with the price. And then you set your audience. Um, this is where we say what percentage of our context should be included in the experiment and how much traffic should be allocated to each variation. So how much traffic from that context. Um, in this instance, we're saying 100% of all users should be included in the experiment. 50% of those users should get true variation, 50% should get false variation. Um, and then after saving this, uh, it's time to develop our, our experiment. Um, but before we do that, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit and talk about the results after the experiment has been run. Uh, within LaunchDarkly, there's a tab on the experiment interface. Um, LaunchDarkly will automatically calculate which variation it thinks is your best choice, but these metrics will also be there, or these statistics will also be there to let you make your own decision if you need to. Um, 
So yeah, traffic is just how many uh, users each experiment or each variation uh, got with, within the experiment. Uh, profitability for each variation to be the best one, and conversion rates, which is the percentage of users that actually performed that, that call to action. So now it's time to uh, put it all together. This is where we'll either develop a custom module or a custom theme and uh, tie it up directly into this tool. Um, so on our projects, we use a custom module. Um, and this is briefly what we need to get launch directly flags working within Drupal for the custom module. Um, but like I said, it can also work with custom theme. Um, and first we need to install and include the launch directly software development kits. Um, and then we need to set up some kind of config to store those, those uh, keys that I showed you earlier, those keys or IDs. Um, and then we need to write some JavaScript. And we need, we need to attach that JavaScript to our page. Um, generally, in a Drupal environment, you'll want to use one side SDK um, for launch directly. These are designed for single use uh, desktop mobile and internet applications. Um, and they're intended to be used in a potentially less secure environment, such as a personal computer or mobile device. Uh, Server side SDKs are designed for multi user systems and intended to be in a trusted environment, such as inside a corporate. Um, on our project, we exclusively use the JavaScript client side of SDK, and all the following examples will be written um, in JavaScript as well. We have given thought to using the PHP SDK in combination with the Drupal backend um, when we wanted to uh, design some larger features, but we ultimately decided to sit um, because we had a complexity around caching and dealing with things that are frequently updated. Um, there are practical workarounds, but using the JavaScript SDK has worked better for us in these uh, instances. You can install the SDKs uh, as NPM packets or NPM assets via Composer. Um, you need to add the asset package as repository, which uh, is shown there in those four lines of code um, that will just be added to your Composer on JSON. Um, but you'll probably want to install them in a folder under the web root in the Epic directory. And in order to do that, there's another package that you'll need from the Oomph team, um, who is one of the sponsors of Gecon. Uh, um, and you'll need to specify your other objects on where you want those SDKs to be installed. Uh, the link at the bottom here um, gives some step by step directions on how to do that. Once the SDK is installed, then you can add it to your library's config. You can see here that I put it in the library's folder under the doc group. Um, this library will be end up being a dependency of any other libraries um, that you make later that actually include your JavaScript code. <laughs> so um, the first thing we need to do when we're actually writing the code is identify our context. Um, so we need to figure out who, who we want to target with our experience, um, the kind, which is typically the user. Um, and then we can have any attributes that we also want to send along with that. Um, for instance, here, there's the, the key. So if, you, if you're targeting one user in particular, they'll have their own key, um, or their own email, or their own name. And that's something that you define in your code. <laughs> Uh, next, we'll initialize the client. Um, and this takes uh, three parameters uh, client ID, which is um, uh, that piece of uh, the SDK keys or IDs that I showed earlier that deals with each environment. Um, and hopefully, that'll be stored in some config somewhere in your Drupal config. Um, the next is the context that we just created. We'll send that along with our initialize function. And finally, our options, which are optional. <laughs> um, there are settings that include things such as uh, alternate service endpoints. And if you're using the federal instance a launch card, you'll need to set those, which I've done here, um, to the federal um, endpoints. 
Um, and then you can start listening for events. Um, once you're initialized, uh, you can use the on method on the client. Um, and this method takes two parameters um, with an optional thing. The commonly used events in my experience are ready and change. Um, ready fires once the client has been uh, finished starting up or initializing. And change happens anytime the client receives new flag data. So if you toggle something in the launch directly interface, um, there's a shooting manual um, trigger that change in. Um, and then there's a callback function. Uh, this is the function where you specify what should happen when that event uh, is triggered. And the third option there is optional and it's a context. Um, so if you want to use a different context than the one you initialize the client with, then you would specify a new context here. Um, but you don't have to. So within that callback, um, that's where you can actually evaluate if uh, the client's variation method is the method that evaluates the flag and returns the variation to the context that you provide. So the first hand parameter here is the unique key for the flag to be evaluated, which you find in the launch directly um, interface. The second parameter is the default value. Um, this is when launch directly um, can't return something or can't find that flag. Um, then you'll have a default value fall back on. In this case here, our variation is I'm um, going to return a Boolean value. If that value is true, we'll do something. And if it's false, we'll do something else. Um, those some things can be things like setting the color of a call to action. So here is all that code that I showed um, on the different slides. I'll condense into one thing. Um, as you can see, it's not much code. Um, your biggest code when you're, when you're developing an experiment or uh, feature players aren't going to be in those do something and do something else methods. Um, but yeah, this is basically all of the JavaScript that you'll need to evaluate a basic Boolean flag um, with one sharply within Google. Um, and then once you have that, you can attach it using um, you know, the standard Drupal way to attach JavaScript to a page. Um, either uh, once you have it in the library's that you handle it. Yeah, attach it through uh, some pre process on sharing to a template or whichever way I um, view you know, uh, would make sense for whatever you're trying to achieve. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, before committing to an actual experience, um, I would do a proof concept where you can actually like make a feature flag, toggle it, see those changes in real time. Uh, once you see that that's working, then doing an actual experiment is, there's not much else to it. Um, but yeah, so in summary, this is what we've learned today. Uh, A-B tests allow us to compare two or more versions of something simultaneously and measure their performance. Launch directly is a feature flag software as a service that has a framework for A-B testing all experiments. Feature flags allow us to target settings of users in order to show those users different versions of something. Um, first, we have to set up our experiment in launch directly. Then we can set up our custom Drupal module or the theme or to allow the experiment to be. Uh, yeah, so any questions? <laughs> Did you evaluate other SAS tools like this before using Launch Sharply? Um, we did not um, because uh, we already had Launch Sharply through our client. Um, they might already pay for it and it's a federated facility. So, um, no. <laughs> Yeah, so the, that example was um, 
the endpoints for the federal instance of launch directly, you don't have to specify those, end, uh, those endpoints if you're using the default version of launch directly, um, which is not the US domain. Uh, yes? Uh, you mentioned that actually most of conflicts with the security risk. Um, I don't know all of them. I know LaunchDarkly is FedRAMP certified. Um, that's the only one I know off the top of my head right now. Yes? Yeah. Uh, what's the status of the Microsoft Azure Cloud Services? Things that launch directly doesn't allow you to do. Um, the biggest thing that I've come across, and I mentioned it a little bit earlier, was uh, like it would be really nice to be able to use PHP SDK with Drupal, um, like especially for those uh, those user flow um, tests where you're, you're testing a whole bunch of things. Um, running into uh, caching and especially caching in our environment that you know, we have varnish and Akamai caching on top of that. Um, it's hard to uh, direct users to um, different things when there's caching in play. That's the, the biggest hang up I've seen. But, um, yeah. Yes? Um, um, so the question was uh, security issues with the PHP SDK. Having not used it, I'm not really familiar with what they are. Like, I'm just going off the base what LaunchDark says, and that it should be a controlled environment. Um, Thank you all so much for attending my presentation.